Hi folks, here's part two, a conversation we had with Australian snake catcher, Jasmine Zelaney. It is lovely to speak to you again. Um, we, left, we left each other in the Iron Range in Northern Queensland about a year and a half ago, although we made Facebook friends. So would you please introduce yourself, our lovely guest? Hi, I'm Jasmine Zeleny. I'm a local snake catcher in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Um, I do a lot of work with nocturnal birds just in my own time as well, so I'd like to dabble in a bit of everything, but my um, occupation is as a full-time snake catcher. Yeah, so that's what, that's what brings us to uh, um, the interviewing you, but for our, our listeners, I'll, I'll just give a quick idea of how we, uh, we met. Uh, so I was in Australia, and I recorded some stuff when I was there um, in the urban environment. But I was in a, the wilderness. I was up in extreme far north Queensland with my mates, and we would see this um, cool-looking off-road nature exploring big, cool, cool thing I got to see out around. And finally, we got to finally meet the occupants, and they were this cool as hell, very attractive couple, <laughs> like. Who are super into nature, and they they travel all around um, photographing nature. And um, we thought you were basically the coolest people we've ever met. And we were had a blast hanging out with you up there. And I come to learn that you um, are a professional snake catcher, and that piqued our interest for the Urban Wildlife Podcast because we like the intersection of wildlife and people. And so I'm correct. You work in Brisbane. I'm yeah. saying that correctly. It's, Americans will think it's called Brisbane, or it's yeah. Brisbane. And so, okay, what company do you work for, and how? Explain how this how this works, and how you came to be doing this. Okay, so I work for a company called Queensland Fauna Consultancy. Um, we do a lot of work. Um, the snake catching side of the business is kind of the smaller part but in itself it's a real monster it's a, it's a huge company it's the oldest snake catching company in Brisbane and we're the biggest team in Brisbane so even though that's not what the company started as it's still its whole own thing um, I started snake catching about five years ago I'm originally from Sydney and I'm talking right in the city so I grew up with no wildlife outside of rock doves and white ibis so nothing really thrilling uh so when i moved up to brisbane when i was around 18 i um, moved straight into an area that's very green wildlife's abundant and i just became obsessed it started as a photography thing um i started looking for snakes driving the mountain roads looking for different species to photograph and from there it, the snake catching thing kind of started when family and friends just realized I had absolutely no fear of them so they'd call me over to help them from the chicken coop or something like that and so it started happening more and more and I thought okay I better do this I better start asking for some money <laughs> and I was city so that's how it started and uh since I finished uni I locked in a full-time position doing it here so okay so let's talk about the snakes um what kind do you encounter often? So here in Brisbane, our two most commonly caught snakes are the coastal carpet python and also the common or green tree snake. Uh, they're both non-venomous, completely harmless, <coughs> except the former is not so harmless to small pets. <laughs> so that's a, a major reason why a lot of people get them moved on. We also get a lot of uh, venomous species, but it's just their nature to kind of avoid people. And a lot of the time, by the time I get there, they're gone. Unlike carpet pythons, which are pretty comfortable sharing a space with a human. So it's a little bit different with those guys. Um, so we get Eastern Browns here in Brisbane, which are the second most venomous land snake in the world. We also get red bellies and a, quite a few mildly venomous species too. Hey, Tony, may I jump in with a question? Absolutely. <laughs> so this is something that I, I, I get curious about. I mean, I think people, um, uh, it, it, I don't know. I mean, all of us know people who are quite afraid of snakes. And um, 
I, I know that we have a, a strong, what I call a strong cultural bias against snakes, so that um, you know people will end up killing them when they really don't need to. And so, just for some perspective, um, Australia, which has some of the most like potently venomous. I don't know if potently is a word, but really potent venom, venomous snakes, um, like in the world. What are the like the bite and death statistics like for for the the venomous snakes that that people could get bitten by in Australia? Eastern Browns are responsible for the most deaths in Australia, but it's realistically one to two deaths per year, if that. One to two. Okay. Yeah, wow. so it's really, really low. It's really low. A lot of people get bitten, but uh, our first aid and our hospital care is very, really, really good here, here in Australia. So um, if you do the right thing and apply first aid, you can save yourself a lot of time and make it easier for you and spend a little bit less time in intensive care as well. So <laughs> a lot of the people that do die uh, have other complications. They might be older or they've put themselves in a really bad position where they're getting, bit, getting bitten multiple times because they're trying to kill the snake. Um, so you're, you're touching on what I was thinking of as the next question, is um, how do people tend to get bitten? Okay, yeah, so it's pretty much when people are... Sna snakes everywhere want to avoid you. They'll do anything to get out of your way, and venomous or not, they're, they're not interested, they can't. They can't eat you. They're much smaller than you. They, there's literally no incentive for them to go after you. So most of the time when people are like bitten, it's because they're trying to catch or kill the snake. There are some times where it may be incidental, but a large portion of the time it's when they're doing the wrong thing. Yeah, up here we think of it as either trying to kill the snake or trying to show off for your girlfriend. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, that sounds right. Just about the same here. Well, how many total deaths in, in Australia a year, all those things combined, do you, do you have that stat? Um, I, it wouldn't be different because a lot of our, say something like, like red bellies, they've never been responsible for a, de a human death. So uh, it would pretty much just be those eastern browns. There may be... Uh, like last year, I think, or the year before, we had a coastal Taipan death, but they're very few and far between. The number's still really low. Since most people get bit because they're handling them, and you handle them for a living, um, what are, how do you avoid that? Like, Is it just you're, you just know how to handle it, or are there any other precautions you take? Like, how, how does one become um, proficient in not getting bit? <laughs> by things that bite people who handle them. Yeah, pretty much is it's <laughs> it's experience and also I don't muck around with them. I'm say when I catch a, a carpet python or a tree snake, I'll keep the snake out for a little bit and and let people have a look at them, take some photos. Uh, that gives me an opportunity to educate them. So uh, with something like an eastern brown. I'll still have the education perspective, but it's not through visuals. It goes straight into the bag. There's no mucking around. I don't really show off with venomous snakes. It's not worth it. Um, pretty much that and experience. The way we handle snakes is uh, tailing them. And I would never, if the snake's in a really difficult position, I'm just not going to catch it if it's dangerous. We're going to have to wait until the snake's in a better position because it's just not worth the risk. Hey, I want to just really quick. You said you tail them, so yes. when I so when I I've talked to guys who do um, who do mostly it's rattlesnakes, but uh, snake rescue that kind of stuff. Um, they I I know with the with those they tend to use a grab stick um, and a bucket and just sort of like put them right in the bucket with the grab stick and then put the lid on the bucket. Um, when you're tailing them, just technique question. What do you mean by tailing? Okay, so it's just when you have your thumb placed on the back of the snake just before the cloaca and have your rest in your hand underneath and you kind of uh, guide them and twist them around so they don't climb back up on themselves and guide them into the bag. Um, I know over in the US everyone is a really big fan of, of snake tongs. Um, they're hardly ever used here. I have a pair. Um, I don't have anything against them. I just think that you have a lot more control 
uh, using your hand and it can be done quickly. But there are a lot of situations where those tongs can be really handy if you're trying to initially grab a snake out of a, a difficult place and then tail it and get it into the bag. But for the most part, you won't see a lot of Australian snake catchers using that tool. Wow. All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> are you using are you using a hook also, or just the just the one yeah, hand? Yeah, a lot of us a lot of us use hooks. Um, pretty much every snake catcher will have a few hooks. Just the tailing makes me think of like Steve Irwin. We always thought he was crazy, but maybe that's just like the default there. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, how is Steve Irwin regarded in your circles? Oh, everyone's a big fan. He's definitely a national treasure. But I think any time, look that. There are plenty of people that don't like what he did. Uh, a lot of people think that he really wound animals up. But at the same time, he was one of the first to do that and he had such a big global audience and it gave people an opportunity to learn about how these animals realistically respond to threats and um, their behaviours and how misunderstood they are. So I think his work definitely had a purpose and what he did was valid, but there's always people that have... A different opinion <laughs> but the majority of, of the um, of the herp scene and just the general Australian public are a big fan of, of what he did so yeah yeah I always kind of liked him but wasn't quite sure exactly how it felt and then when I started you know making friends that were more in the herp scene they you know I saw we you know it would just inevitably come on sometimes and my friend would be freaking out and be like, man, he, he knows what he's doing. Just look at the way he's holding that thing. Like, he he's, you know, really professional, and he, he knows exactly what he's doing. So that gave me a lot more respect. Um, it's kind of funny that, um, is it almost annoying that you have to, like, you are from the country where the most iconic Herbert of all time is from? Is that, like, does it get a little annoying or is it is it just you know you accept that that's where you're from and you're, you're always going to be people are always going to be talking about him um no i haven't found it annoying at all and it's, yeah it's not something that i've really made a big connection with when i've spoken to other people so um yeah it's not really something that crosses my mind too much actually what does it cost to get a snake removed Okay, that's a really good question. <laughs> so it varies. It varies depending on the business that's running it. Unfortunately, everywhere else apart from the Northern Territory, um, snake catching is through independent businesses, so there is a charge, whereas up in the Northern Territory, the government subsidises it and it's not something that the locals have to pay for. Uh, that would never work here in, in Brisbane. It's such a big city and snake catching is a huge business here. So roughly you can get a snake removed, depending on the, the business you call, somewhere between 88 Australian dollars up to, let's say, roughly 150 Australian dollars. It just depends on the day you call, the time you call. If you're a business or just a private residence, that fee will vary. Um, a call at 2 a.m. is going to cost you a little bit more than one in the middle of the day on a Saturday, something like that. <laughs> and where do you take them? So we, the, we operate under government permits, something called a da damage mitigation permit, which outlines... Uh, all of the um, processes that we have to go to and the conditions of the permit. So with snakes, it really kind of just says nearest suitable habitat, but we know that snakes don't translocate that well. All the research has said that. If you remove them too far out of their home range and they do have a specific home range. So we try and keep them... Look, the point of our permits is to remove an immediate threat. We're not trying to completely remove the snake and give it no chance of survival. It has to stay in its area. So uh, we remove it from the immediate... Sometimes it's people's people and their pets are a threat to the snake, not the other way around. So we need to um, remove the snake and just remove it to the closest suitable habitat to where it was removed from. So any kind of um, remnant bushland that's as close as possible to where we caught it. 
I can't just put it in someone else's yard, unfortunately. <laughs> well, hey, I'll actually jump in and ask about that because it's something that I um, that I think Tony and I have encountered a lot just in our lives as people who like to teach people about urban wildlife, um, but also in the podcast, um, which is that we have in our heads that that let's say the ideal habitat for oh I don't know um, let's say a uh, a garter snake, take a small North American snake as an example, is like, is somewhere quote unquote natural, you know, like a, a, a pond or a meadow or something like that. Um, when a garter snake might live its entire life in, you know, a, in maybe, um, maybe a little patch of woods, but really in a whole bunch of people's backyards sort of all mushed together, you know. Um, and so for something like a, um, I don't know, let's say, like a like one of your brown snakes um or a carpet python uh it, is their habitat really the backyard though like where um i mean are they are, are you seeing them are they are they wandering in from somewhere or are these populations that for the most part uh sort of are are hatched and and tend to live in those in that kind of suburban or urban landscape it's a really good question. So, of course, we have carpet pythons in natural areas. You can drive up to our nearest mountain range, the Diaguilla Range, which is all national park, and you'll find some really big old carpet pythons cruising around there. But in Brisbane, carpet pythons do really, really well in an urban environment. So these snakes, their whole lifestyle is literally moving from house to house. That is that I can't catch a snake from suburban Brisbane and chuck it up into that national park because it will die. Because that snake from an urban environment only knows that we attract all of its main prey items from when they're tiny up until when they're a 2.5 metre, 3 metre snake. So we attract Asian house geckos, which are a great meal for them when they're hatchlings. Then they move on to the house mouse, which we attract plenty of black rats we attract plenty of those and then they can move on to a lot of backyard poultry guinea pigs and then they start eating things like brush tail possums which do really well in an urban environment as well so just because there are snakes up in the remote national park there doesn't mean that that's a suitable place for me to release an urban carpet python which is a really important thing i think a lot of people might not want to pay the fee and they think they can move the snake themselves and just chuck it up on the mountain but that snake doesn't know that lifestyle that snake knows getting food really easily and not having to travel a larger distance for it i wasn't sure if this is within the 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 purview of what um of what the business does or not but um just in case I was kind of curious do you work with homeowners um to talk about ways that they might make their um their homes or their yards less attractive to to the snakes that they're calling you to remove? Absolutely. That's a massive part of what we do. Uh, we do it pretty much any time we go out to a snake call. If we see something wrong, we always make recommendations. But a lot of people just call us out for something that's called a yard inspection. We They might not even have a snake, but they're a bit paranoid. So we'll come out and assess their whole yard and make recommendations of what easy changes they could make. For example, some people might have a lot of piles of timber or some scrap metal lying around. And as we all know, that's a favorite hiding place for snakes, especially in the cooler months. Or they might have a lot of um, lawn clippings from when they've mowed their lawn and they just accumulate this massive pile of old grass, which is the number one spot that a carpet python would love to put their eggs for incubation because it's warm, it's humid, and towards the end of the year, we always remove large number of um, carpet python eggs from those big piles of grass clippings. So little things like that that are super easy for them to get rid of um, make a massive difference. But another really important thing I have to remind people, especially in a place like Brisbane, is that you can do everything right in the world and a snake might still use your yard to get somewhere else. But the main thing is that you're not giving it an incentive to stay and hang around. So what you're saying is when Billy and I get a house with more 
land on it, we should put out lots of tin and grass clippings. Tony, yeah. I'm, I'm already there, man. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that's that's one of my I mean I, I I love living in a city I have no feel no need for more space if I had it yeah there'd be some boards laying out <laughs> could you talk a little bit about your city and and the opportunities for urban wildlife that you you go out I know you go out all the time um, all right night, for fun yeah but you go a little do you do you spend much time actually within Brisbane or are you always going out to the um, the countryside to, to your wildlife observing a lot of it is in brisbane uh, we're really lucky here that it's a lot of our wildlife can persist in an urban environment but at the same time a lot of them are really suffering queensland has the worst land clearing rates um which is really embarrassing so brisbane the gold coast is really bad at the moment uh, brisbane is not much better so a lot of our gliders and koalas, you know, koala is a national icon and uh, unfortunately they're threatened by a lot of development here. But th there are a lot of corridors for the wildlife and a lot of uh, protected areas, whether it be council uh, reserves or national park. A lot of what I do is in the Greater Brisbane area, which is nice. Um, there's plenty of wildlife to see here. but. There needs to be a little bit more awareness so we can protect what we have left so um, future generations can still find all of this awesome wildlife right in the big city. And if you go out at night um, in a park in, in Brisbane, what are some things you might see at night there? So if you're going to any sort of um, bushland reserve in Brisbane, you're almost guaranteed to see a nocturnal bird called a tawny frogmouth. Many people confuse them for owls, but they are not. They lack the impressive talons of an owl and have pretty pathetic feet. Um, so they mostly uh, feed on different invertebrates and may pick up a rodent here or there. Um, so they're a very common nocturnal bird. They do very well in suburbia. Uh, another thing you might see are a few species of possum very different to your American possums, <laughs> a bit cuter, I think. So we have a common brush-tailed possum, which does very, very well in an urban environment. A lot of um, people have possums in their ceiling spaces. It's really common in Brisbane. And because of that, it's also really common to have a python in your ceiling in Brisbane. Um, so that's very common in the bush, brush-tailed possums, ring-tailed possums. Uh, you might be lucky to see some small glider species um, in remnant bushland around Brisbane. We have quite a number of different glider species. There's a really small one called a feather tail glider. It's like the size of a small rodent. Um, and then you have your sugar gliders, which I know are a very popular pet over there. Um, squirrel gliders. And then you get these really impressive one metre long gliders called the greater glider, which uh, are present in a lot of remnant bushland around Brisbane, which is pretty special. Let's look at that pictures of let's look at that pictures of feather tailed glider. It's about as cute as an animal gets. Yeah, they're pretty adorable. Um, hey, I wanted to ask one more thing real quick. So we heard a little bit about, and you talked and said a lot of interesting stuff about the the routine animals that you find. Um, and just for my part, I would so much love to have carpet pythons living in my ceiling, but um, the, the question I had for you was what's the, if you had to rate like the most unusual thing you've been called out for a snake that you were just like, I, how did, how did it get here? Um, and I don't know if, if, for, if it helps you, you could do ever, or like if you wanted to do in the past year, whatever makes sense for how you remember it. Um, look, we get a lot of escaped pets. That's really common. So for example, I went out to the city just west of Brisbane called Ipswich uh, earlier this year, and I turned up to a Centralian carpet python or a bread lie python, which are found in Central Australia naturally. So he was obviously a pet and would be missed by someone. That's really common um, to pick up lost pets here and there. Uh, every now and then we also get called out to illegal exotics. Um, 
a lot of them might have just been dumped. So it's common for catchers to turn up to corn snakes. Uh, also things like red tail boas, red eared sliders, things like that, um, so which are not supposed to be in our environment, <laughs> which is the very reason people aren't permitted to keep exotics. So things like that. I also get to, uh, called out to things that are not snakes at all. So a really common one is a blue tongue lizard. People are way too terrified to take one step closer and see that it has legs. <laughs> That's very common. Uh, another one is snake catchers get called out to toy snakes quite often, just rubber snakes, and people... Uh, uh, it's great that they're being cautious. I would rather them be cautious and feel silly than feel like they have to get too close to confirm what it is if they're not comfortable. So um, being called out to rubber snakes happens a few times a year as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be my favorite. All right. <laughs> um, well, all right. Out in the west of our country, we actually have a rubber boa. <laughs> Fair point. Um disagree real snake fascinating snake too um but a topic for another time um would you mind when you gotta come out here we could take you you to see some of our cool wildlife well that would be awesome i don't know when i'm ever getting getting over there i know um we're doing we're trying to do a lot of australia australia is such a big place <laughs> and there's so much to see here so we're we've got a few more places we're trying to check out just nationally first and then I know, um, I know Matt really wants to get up to Canada because we know people there that are willing to show us some owls. So maybe we can um, visit North America as well. That would be nice. Oh yeah, well I mean, you know, we'll show you owls around here. Yeah. Okay. We'll stop yeah. it. Stop Canada. Yeah, I can show you screech owl, great horn, <laughs> barb, and uh, and we'll t we'll take you to see some rattlesnakes. Awesome. Oh, that would be fantastic. You should come to my wedding in this September. It's really good rattlesnake and black bear habitat right there. You know what? It's funny you say that because people always think we're crazy because we have to go out at night for our owls. I know you obviously have a lot of nocturnal owls as well, but you can see a lot of them during the day, and we don't have that luxury. And people go on about Australia having the most dangerous animals in the world. But I'm sorry, we do not have bears. We do not have these kinds of animals. <laughs> yeah. I don't ever feel scared going out in the bush whatsoever in Australia. Um, I think the most scared I've ever felt was a cassowary planter up north. But there's nothing, you know, all of our dangerous animals are really easily avoided. And we have the luxury where we can just go out into the bush at night and not have to worry so <laughs> I um I would definitely argue that that um there's not so many dangerous things to worry about out at night in Australia compared to over there <laughs> <laughs> perhaps but again it's it's so rare you know it's you know in general in America seems as anywhere else your drive to the woods is more dangerous than being in the woods and and the, the most interesting thing in America is other people. So <laughs> once you get away from people, you're, you're much safer. Yeah, that's a good point. I think a lot of people always ask me about the risks of my job and how dangerous it is to be catching snakes. And I tell every single person it's not a really – there's nothing brave about what we do. Um, snakes are very predictable, easy to read. Um, you know, if you – know what you're doing and you don't muck around it, it's it's a safe job the most dangerous part of the job is driving to the job and being on the road that's definitely the most dangerous part of my day is driving from house to house nice to talk to you guys thanks have a great day bye bye see you, you too bye thanks so much for listening Thanks to Yatin Kalki for part one of this episode and to Jasmine Zelaney for talking with us for this part two. Um, now for you guys, please feel free to drop us an email at urbanwildlifecast at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Twitter at urbwildlifecast and you can find our Facebook page and get in touch with us there. Um, you can also contribute uh, with money 
via www.patreon.com slash urbanwildlifecast, where we've been raising a little bit for some better microphones to improve your listening experience. So thanks again, and please stay tuned for the rest of this series of episodes that's going to focus more on wildlife rehabbing um, rather than the relocation rescue part. Thanks.